So we're just going to just, I want to round up today the message I began a couple of weeks ago, talking about um, the scripture from Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. And I, I was thinking on this during the week, that God, why is this scripture so important to you in what you're in my thinking at this time and this season? And the Lord began to speak to me about, you know, he's calling the church, he's calling us individually back to that knowledge of him, back to that place where we understand that he has called us to significance. He has called us not to mediocrity, but to significance. Your life is meant to be significant. And what, is, what does significance mean to God? Significance is not when you are the prime minister of, of Canada. God defines significance by you, by the person and not by you. The person being him. And that means that your significance is tied to your obedience to doing what he has called you to do. You could be prime minister, but if God did not call you to that, then you have not attained significance. And God is thinking also and talking and also wanting us to think about the church in the sense of this word significance. What do I mean by that? We all talk about the temptations and the things that are in the world today. But do you know the Bible says that to every temptation, God has made a way of escape. Do you know that the way of escape that God has designed is the church? It's the church. Recently, my husband and I, we met with someone we had, um, been, you know, we had met um, a couple months ago. Didn't know this person, and this person happens to be a Hindu. And, and, you know, the first time I met him, and we met him for something, you know, totally, you know, separate, it was business. And I could not help myself. In the midst of the conversation, I interrupted and said, are you okay? Someone I was meeting for the first time, because I was hearing something in my spirit, man. And I couldn't contain it. Um, you know, by the Holy Spirit, I asked him that question. This was over two months ago. And we've met him. Since then, we've shared things with him. Every time I've wanted to share the gospel, the Holy Spirit says, don't share the gospel. I tell him about God. I tell him about the word of God. I tell him about the love of God. But I have not presented the gospel to say, you need to get born again. I've just held myself back. On Friday again, he asked to meet with us. And I began to talk to him again. And in there, I began to hear Pastor David's voice because I was chomping at the bait to say, I'm going to present the gospel to you. You have to be born again. But I began to think about the times Pastor David would talk to me about, I would say, how was your week, Pastor? And he would say, oh, I, it was really great. I met this person. I just loved on them. I just loved on them. I just loved on them. And I, and, the, and I could hear that, and I knew God was getting my attention. And so I didn't present the gospel. Again, I began to love on him. He's been through a lot, you know, huge, huge life-altering circumstances that everyone around rejected him. He's been through a lot. His name in the news, his reputation smashed all over the internet, just a multi-millionaire down to nothing. And I just, in that conversation again, my husband and I just kept loving on him and encouraging him. And I was sharing the truths of the scriptures with him. I was saying, in the Bible, you know, I, you know, this is what it says. This is how God feels about you. This is what the future can look like. And I said, you know, finally I had to remark. I said, you don't look better. He said, I have to tell you the truth. From the minute I met you, my life changed. He said, my life has not been the same. He said, things have been getting better and better and better. And that's the message I have for you today. I want to talk to you about the fact that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, he says, brethren, this is Paul talking. Paul was talking about knowing him. He was talking about knowing God in verse 10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This is Paul after many years in ministry. 
I want to point out something to you. How many of you know that at this time, Paul was born again? He was not talking about the new birth. He was not saying, I need to know him, get born again. No. He was spirit-filled. He was not talking about being spirit-filled. But he was talking about an intimate fellowship and relationship. And he went on to say in verse 13, 14, saying that this one thing I do. He was trying to explain how you get to knowing God. How to walk in intimacy with God. How to have that fellowship. He said, one thing, not two things. One thing. I forget those things which are behind. I reach forth unto those things which are before. I press. That speaks about effort. That talks about time. That talks about priority. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. And he said, this prize is knowing Christ. And I began to say, if I was to take that scripture, knowing that in John chapter 3 verse 16, he talks about the purpose for which Jesus came was to give us eternal life. And Jesus explained eternal life in John 3 16, um, in John 17, 3, saying that eternal life is knowing him. And so together, I took the scriptures and I gave myself a confession of faith. And by the way, that's what you're meant to do in meditating on the scriptures. You take the scriptures as it comes alive in you. You begin to expand it out. And so I, I wrote, I said, I am single-minded. I have one compelling focus. I forget and put out of my mind. I cease to think of or consider the past. Especially in decisions that impact my future, I do not consult my past. I do not recreate the past in my future. Rather, I reach forth and reach out and I fasten my heart to the future as I meditate, as I think on, ponder the word of God. And the blueprint of my life that is consistent with God's plan for my life. It comes alive on my inside. Why? Because my meditation in the word creates in me a Bible hope or an imagination. And that imagination begins to walk with the faith of God inside of me to reach out, to strive, to run straight, not wavering or doubting, but in hot pursuit of the mark, the prize of the upward call, the victory prize, which is to know him, that I may experience on this side of life, eternal life. I experience eternal life when I know Christ and the Father because I move beyond the relationship that was created at the new birth into the fellowship where my Savior becomes my Lord. This is my life purpose, to know him. Because when I am a wife, a mother, a minister at my job, those are all my platforms and my callings and my giftings. But they are not the most important thing. The most important thing and the purpose for which I live is that I might know him. You know, all of this is not possible in my own flesh without the Holy Spirit. You cannot win in life and you cannot have a life of significance if you do not have the Holy Spirit. If you have not cultivated a life of walking in the Spirit. And when we talked about this last week or two weeks ago, I said walking in the Spirit is the same as being immersed in the Word of God. You do not get to the best that God has for you without the Holy Spirit. I talked to you last week. I said he was the one that was at creation, hovering upon the face of the deep. What is that hopeless circumstance? Because if you look into Genesis chapter 1, he said the earth was without form and was void. He talks about the fact that there was something that was wrong, but we're not going to get into that. But what is that part of your life that seems to be without form and that is void? What is that part of your life that looks like a desert today? When you allow the Holy Spirit, the same one who was at creation, and the same one who, who, who was there to take the word of God and quicken it and make things come alive, when you let him be in your life, he will do exactly the same thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, 
talking about the Holy Spirit and his work, his present day ministry. He says, anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to, God, to people, but to God. And he talks about the fact that indeed no one understands them because they are uttering mysteries. Mysteries. The Greek word mysteria, I said um, was that it means the hidden things. The hidden things. And what are these hidden things? I'll come to another scripture later on that talks about the fact that the things that God has laid up for you, the eye has not seen it, ear has not heard it. These are the hidden things. The plan that God has for your life. The details of the plan. The strategies that cause you to win in life. The witty ideas and inventions. The success that determines your life is in those mysteries. This is why we talk about praying in the Holy Ghost. I'll come to that in a little bit. So let's look some more at the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ. You know, we talk a whole lot about the Holy Spirit. And people begin to want to know, what is it about the Holy Spirit? Do you know that when Jesus was leaving, he said, I will send you another comforter. When Jesus was on this side of life, the Bible says for 30 years we don't hear of him doing anything. But suddenly he comes to John the Baptist and he is baptized and we see how the Spirit of God comes upon him like a dove. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to fulfill his ministry here on earth, how much more you? Maybe the reason the things that you are struggling with, maybe the reason that you are not able to attain, maybe the reason things have not worked as you want them to work is because you have not engaged yourself with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The, and you know, we cannot know the Holy Spirit outside of the word of God. Why do I say that? Because the Bible tells us that all scripture was given by the inspiration of God. The Bible says God in Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, that God who at sundry times and in diverse manners has in this last day spoken to us by his son. But we see that through the word of God, that the word of God comes by the Holy Spirit. So we cannot know, just like I cannot know brother Tim outside of his word. I may know him in person and be able to recognize him if I see him go by. But I truly get to know him by the things he says. You know, and this is really critical. Because when you begin to he think about the voices that come into your head, you cannot know if it is God speaking to you or the devil, except that you have first known his voice through the word. You cannot separate him from the word. You know, this is why. When you meditate on the word, your meditation in the scriptures is incomplete without a meditation on the person who spoke the word. Many times we handle the scriptures, but the scriptures don't come alive because the word without the spirit is not living. You've got to think on he who spoke the word. If somebody says to me, I'm going to be at your house at five o'clock. Knowing that particular person, I will just simply not even prepare for them to come. Because I am sure that two hours later, they still haven't arrived. But there is some, and you, you, it, yes, it's funny, but let me tell you something. This is a, a quick digression. This is the reason why many of us, our words are inoperative. Because our words are designed to create because we're made like in the Im image of God and to produce in our lives. Your word does not produce because you render them ineffective by lying, by not being a person of integrity, not keeping your word, by gossiping, by speaking wrong things. You shut down the power in your own, in your own life. You know, I have this very strong suggestion. To walk in the spirit, you're going to have to you know, turn down the volume of words that God did not give you to speak. But that was a digression. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit as our helper. In John chapter 14, verse 16, um, 16 to 17, it says, Jesus saying that he will send us um, the Holy Spirit, another advocate, to help us and to be with us forever. The Spirit of truth. He's here to help us and to be with us forever. So if he's meant to be with you forever, is he truly showing up in your life? Today we talked about speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is not the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. It's actually...
actually what God has given to you, your prayer language. And if, you're not, if you don't uh, um, activate speaking in tongues in your prayer time, you may not be effective in prayer. Because the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit praying for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You are not harnessing the strength of the Holy Spirit as your helper in the place of prayer. Let me tell you something. If you tell me that you're drinking tea and you, I see you with a glass of water, it does not look like tea to me. Why? Because when you put a tea bag in hot water, it gets steeped and the color changes. The same way, if the Holy Spirit is in your life, I shall see the evidence. I shall see the evidence. I shall see the evidence. If you're walking in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if you're turning up the pilot light in your life, I shall see the evidence. And it's not just in how loud you pray in tongues. And you know something? It's about, you know, we begin to see your conversation is different. We, your priorities show that God is first. Your love walk. The flow of the gifts of the Spirit in your life. What does praying in the Spirit do? Praying in the Spirit is not there to make God do something for you. Praying in the Spirit does not give you more favor with God. Praying in the Holy Ghost is there to make you sensitive. Praying in the Holy Ghost is about emboldening you to walk by faith and not by your five physical senses. Praying in the Spirit gives you more leverage in the spirit realm. The Holy, you, you, you know, we, we, we look at things, we look at your social media. Some of you, I go, you go, I, you know. I'm not a social media person and I don't judge you if you are because to me, honestly, the social media is a very effective tool for us to do so many great things. But I, I, I refrain from it because nobody needs to consult my personal opinion about the politics of this world. I have a message to the, to the, to the body of Christ and I will not sacrifice my message on the altar of my opinion. And all of us have the ministry of reconciliation. But our personal opinions seem to trump that. You know, we have the Holy Spirit as our great intercessor who helps us in the place of prayer. Romans 8 verse 26 says, I'm going to go back to that social media thought. That's what I hear in my spirit. If I were to, to look into your social media, what will I see? Will I see the thoughts of the Holy Spirit? If like Jesus, Jesus received the Holy Spirit. He said, I only say what he tells me to say. I only do what he tells me to do. This is intimacy. That's the definition. What will I see? If I took an inventory of your Instagram, of your Facebook, of your Twitter, what are you tweeting? You know, think about these things. You think it doesn't matter to God? It matters. Remember, I said to you that a life of significance is that you are living out the plan God intends for your life. I said to you that a life of, that God has made a way of escape. He said to every temptation, there is a way of escape. God's escape is located inside the church, the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit, he is the spirit of truth. So when you invite him into your place of prayer, that is not when you pray the facts. The Holy Spirit only responds to the truth of the word. This is why in Genesis chapter 1, the word had to be spoken for him to move. But your prayer may not have been effective because you are praying the facts. You are praying the circumstances. You are not praying the truth of God's word. And the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth, not the spirit of facts and problems. If you will be more selective in the place of prayer, you will be more effective. He is the great revelator. That's what I call him. I don't know that there is such a word. But Matthew 4, chapter 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? If you look at the Greek, it says man will live by the rhema, the hearing of the anointed spoken word of God. 
Why is this important? It's, it's important if you don't lean on the Holy Spirit to reveal what you're reading and studying to you, you don't get to the place of transformation. It is what is revealed to you that has the power to transform your life and to bring about manifestation. Why? Because faith can only begin where the will of God is known. If you don't have a revelation, there is no, faith cannot work. You are going based on presumption. And some people will say, um, no, I, I, I need to just look at what, you know, this person spoke. Or if it happened in brother A's life, it can happen in my life. Absolutely. But you've got to wait for it to be revealed to you. Because when it's not revealed to you, if I go to Jamie and say, God did this for Jamie, or Jamie spoke a word to me, so therefore it automatically belongs to me. Unless I have a revelation of it, it's like taking a check to the bank that was not written to me and trying to draw it on my own account. You know, um, Bill Winston gave an example during the Southwest Believers Conference. He said, sometimes people act on a word that was not given to them. And the example he gave was of, of, of um, Pharaoh. God gave Israel a word to cross the Jordan on dry land. land. And then the, 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 the armies of Pharaoh thought they could act on a word that was not given to them. We know what happened to them, right? <laughs> He's also our great teacher. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, you know, we, we, we know that the Bible says that Christ has been made our wisdom. But how many of you know, know too that he's not only made our wisdom, there's an, he sent us the Holy Spirit. He didn't say that, I have been made your wisdom. It needs to end there. He took us a step further when he sent us the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, we, that what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. So look at what God did. I'll read another scripture to you, and I will, I will explain. Proverbs chapter 4, verse, um, verse 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. He said, and what that begins to show you is that we need knowledge, we need wisdom, and we need understanding. We need both the, the, the spiritual, uh, well, we need it in the spiritual, not just the natural. We need wisdom, we need knowledge, we need understanding, and we need wisdom. You say, what's the difference? The Bible talks about all three. Basically, knowledge is Knowing what is yours. Like Philemon says that you have to acknowledge every good thing that's been done for you. You've got to know. Because God cannot deliver to you what you don't know. There are things that God has for you that he has laid up for you, but you have to know it. Secondly, you have to understand what is yours. That means you've got to have meaning or revelation that comes out of that knowledge. But wisdom ties it all together because wisdom is the ability to use what you know and to take it all and to get to what is next for you in life. I'm going to end here, but I will explain what that means to you. Why is this important? It's important for you to know because God has put resources in this earth and he's not going to do anything about those resources. Everything that you need, all that pertains to life and godliness is here. But you can only key into it by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, so if, if you think about the fact that from years, centuries ago, there were trees. But it took man walking in knowledge, understanding and wisdom to make chairs. The resources are here. God is not creating anything new. It's all here. But it takes wisdom. And the Bible says in Proverbs 20 that counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. You only draw it out by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. You've got to learn to stay quiet. 
to pray in the spirit, to listen to him. Let him be your counselor. Let him be your helper. And let him give you the wisdom that will get you unstuck and take you to the next level. Praise the Lord. I didn't quite finish this, but I think I'll round this up next week in a few minutes. Um, because Pastor Lina and I talked about that. We expected this. But it's about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to begin to think on him and think about his present day ministry in your lives. Are you yielded to him? Is he just your savior or is he also your Lord? In the mighty name of Jesus, we just want to thank you, Father God, for being with us today through this service. What a powerful time of testifying of your goodness, of your amazing love. We just give you the praise for it, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Maybe you are there, you are online, you've been listening to us, you've been watching us rejoice. You've been saying to yourself, why are these people so happy? What is, what, what's making, what makes them tick? It's the new birth. It's the new birth. It's knowing that we, we've, been, we, we, we've been raised on to a new life. That in Christ Jesus, we have a new beginning. And we want to invite you today, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, this is your day, this is the opportune time. There is no better time than now to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Can you imagine? No, you can't because you haven't experienced it. But we invite you to ask Jesus into your heart because the word says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus, and he will become the Lord of your life. He will come into your, life, into your life. He will make you a species of being that has never existed. And there will be no past because his blood will take care of your past. And maybe you've heard me talk about the Holy Spirit and you're wondering what is this? What is this that makes these people just bubble over and sing and rejoice and just speak in these in this tongues that we've never heard? The Holy Spirit is here for you. If you will invite him into your heart and just say right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I have heard that Jesus died for me and I open my heart and I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. And Holy Spirit, I want to speak in other tongues. I want to know you intimately. And I just right now by faith receive that evidence of that infilling in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, just open your mouth and begin to speak out in other tongues. And I invite you to contact us at the church. All of our contact information is up on the screen. Don't let one more day go by. Do not let one more hour go by without making it right with Jesus. Hallelujah.